Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the end of the week, if that's when you're listening to this show, which would be the case if you're listening to it live on air. Who knows when you listen to the podcast? So two-thirds of today's show is about sleep and or dreams. Fittingly, I had a really terrible night's sleep last night. And when I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep, I put a podcast on. And I often put a BBC series called In These Times, In Our Times. In Our, I don't even know what it's called. In Our Time. I'm going to say it's called In Our Time. Uh, it's posted by Melvin Bragg. And it's sort of interesting and boring at the same time, which is kind of what I need to go back to sleep. And instead it was about eclipses. And I just found the eclipse. <laughs> I just found the whole idea of an eclipse very upsetting. It made me stay awake thinking they shouldn't even allow eclipses. It's just too weird. Anyway, that's enough about me. It's time to talk about what we're going to talk about today. A little bit later in the show, we'll talk about Sandman, which is a screen realization, a multi-part series on Netflix uh, of the work of some work by Neil Gaiman, a towering figure in the world of fantasy. Uh, and we'll also talk about the word toxic and the way it has come to have a special kind of, I don't know, close sesame magic meaning uh, in, in internet culture and the way internet culture kind of slops on to our actual interpersonal relationships. But we're going to begin by something I you would never have guessed when I sent this thing around that it was going to touch off the kind of furor that it touched off both as we emailed one another, but also as one of our panelists took it out onto social media and I don't know, just everywhere. Uh, so, but before I get into what that topic is, let me introduce the panel. Heldra Mira is a multimedia producer at Trinity College and the co-host of the So Pretentious podcast with our good friend Vivian Nabetta. And Tracy Wu Fastenberg is development officer at Connecticut Children's. Bill Usman is professor of media studies at Sacred Heart University. And joining us for this topic only, to the best of my knowledge, Kat Pastor, uh, who is our technical producer and, according to this, Assistant Radio Operations Manager at Connecticut Public. I didn't know that was your job title. Very impressive. <coughs> it sounds good. All right. So here's the whole thing. The Wall Street Journal, in a very Wall Street Journal-y kind of way, um, wrote a, uh, ran a piece this week um, basically saying that, well, I mean, the, the little tag on it said, if millennials killed the fussy top sheet, Gen X and boomers have something to say about it. There are very passionate people on both sides. The notion being that millennials, you know, and this is we're painting with very broad strokes here, that millennials dislike top sheets. They don't want them. They don't see why anybody wants them. Uh, and they've actually sort of affected the market for them. There are even companies now <laughs> that will sell sheet sets a term I have to say very carefully, sheet sets uh, that do not include a top sheet because who needs them? Who wants them? So it turns out, you know, to my great surprise, everybody apparently sleeps in beds that either do or do not have top sheets. It is a universal condition almost uh, that that this is true. Um, so I don't know. So Tracy Wu Fasterberg, I think you kind of more than anybody else – took this big ball of percale and ran with it. Uh, and even you're the one who went out on Facebook and started polling people and everything. I don't know. What's going on here? What are you sensing? Why are people – it's so easy to get people worked up about this. So I have heard this argument back and forth regarding the top sheet for a few years now. Um, so it's not entirely unfamiliar. And it's kind of one that I very much understand because think about how much – time we spend in our beds, how much time we want to make that we spend thinking about, you know, what kind of sheets, how many pillows, how fluffy should those pillows be? All of those pieces, because it's something that we all have in common for the most part, unless you are sleeping in a hammock, which more power to you. Um, but you could put a top sheet on you in a hammock. Uh, so I think it's something we all relate to, and it has to do with our comfort, with our respite, with our safety of where we are. Um, and I still don't know what made the generational divide between top sheet versus no top sheet? Like where did that trend start per se? Um, but I, I personally am a very loving of my top sheet. It needs to be <laughs> nice and crisp. It is, you know, it wraps me up at night. Half the time I sleep without a blanket and just that. And I adore, as my husband will tell you, clean sheet day. It is my favorite day of the week when you put those clean sheets on there. Yeah. And I just feel like it wouldn't be the same thing without that top sheet and that like tactile feeling of the coolness and the smoothness. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm passionate about it. So because it is such a, my bed's such a, 
comfortable place for me. That may be why everybody is really taking their stances strongly. But we sense, we sense, like I, I sense that within you, and it would be very characteristic of you in general, Wu, that you don't really care what other people do, right? I mean, you want your top sheet. It's not you th- like you think they're disgusting uh, if, if, if you don't have them. No, I mean, I did ask the follow-up question for those who don't use a top sheet. Does that mean then you launder your duvet cover? And I'm using duvet particularly for Jonathan. (laughs) Um, Or your comforter or your blankets or, you know, your shroud, whatever it is. Are you cleaning that the same time that you do your fitted sheet and your um, pillowcase? And for the most part, you know, people said, yes, they are, you know, fairly regularly. And that would be my only point where it might be a little (laughs) icky to me. (laughs) But then I also know there are people who don't change sheets for months at a time either. So yeah, see, listen, guess- listen to the groaning that's going on in the background here. Okay, just <laughs> because it turns out the panel is pretty pro-top sheet, but the two people who are off-air are most closely associated with this show, Jonathan McNichol, or a.k.a. McPants, uh, and Cat Pastor, are both anti-top sheet. So we, we need to have one of them on the air. Now for an opposing viewpoint, ladies and gentlemen. Cat Pastor, who has a very impressive title that I've already forgotten. <laughs> All right, listen. So I understand that <laughs> it's a preference, but top sheets, like I'm kind of a terrorist when I sleep. Like I'm kicking, <laughs> I'm all over the bed. Um, top sheets do nothing but screw everything up for me. And even if it's the only blanket, it's like too cold. If you have a blanket over it, it's too hot. It always ends up like bunched up at your feet so that when you need to like go make your bed in the morning, you have to like go like cave diving in your bed to find it. I just don't see (laughs) the point of it. But actually, I do keep all my top sheets because they do serve two purposes. The first one is I put them over my furniture if I have like a gross person coming over so that they don't make direct contact with like my couch. And they're also really flammable. So yeah, that's, uh, I guess those are the only two things. You just say flammable? Yeah, they're really flammable. (laughs) (laughs) So Which is are you bad. setting please, people on please fire? Please do not ask a follow-up question. I am begging you. <laughs> do not ask her. Is a faucet movie, The Burning Bed? Do not ask her a follow-up question. I, I will give like you anything. I feel like you're a nightmare cat. You should be in Sandman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She should be in Sandman. Uh, and she would perk the whole series up quite a bit, by the way, if she were. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, Bill, well, actually, I'm going to go go to Helder next, actually, because but and that's to give Bill time to put on his <laughs> professor hat and try to work out a kind of generational theory about this, and and just to sort of prime that pump a little bit. I would say that the Wall Street Journal observe, observed that at least one uh, social media person said that millennials not only killed or tried to kill the top sheet, but also tried to kill chain restaurants, marriage, and napkins. And then I found another thing where they appear to have killed the two spaces after the period in sentence punctuation. So there's – I don't know if any of this is even remotely true, but there it is. So but so Helder, where, now where do you come down on all this? I mean, I don't know. I was raised by a mother that worked in a laundry so <laughs> who was very meticulous about like making beds and the top sheet was like an essential part of it. How dare I even think about not sleeping with the top sheet? So for whatever – like this is all new to me that people don't sleep with top sheets that's ridiculous like plus i have a cat and have had cats and a dog for years so like i need the duvet to take care of those guys and the rest of it like i need the sheet the top sheet as my buffer between like a cat walking all over me during the night um and just (laughs) yeah no like i don't get like the top sheet's perfect right now during you have a little ac going in the summer like the top sheet like helps you with like keeping just the right temperature in the room Um, and then if you're at a hotel like I've been unfortunately staying at over the my travel experiences over the past month it's like when you get that AC that's way too cranked up you need that top sheet and the blanket and the duvet and everything kind of like keeping you comforting and for me it's just like a little piece of like my childhood still feeling like you know that little bit of like top sheet blanket action is is still like like helping me go to sleep at night so that's my 
take on the top sheet. All right. Millennial that killed everything else. Right. I, I do feel like there's a lot of nose panelists that I've had on for years and I don't know that much about them. I feel like I know really too much about all three of you at this point <laughs> just from handling this topic. But I don't know, Bill, do you have a working hypothesis about why millennials would have strong preferences about not only top sheets, but napkins and marriages and chain restaurants and, and spaces after periods? Oh, just because they're so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Those things no. are annoying or the millennials are annoying? Uh, millennials. Yeah. No, that's that's just a joke. It's a joke Everybody, is. don't tweet me about this. Um, I, I have to admit, so first of all, I am very strongly pro top sheet. I'm appalled, you know, oh, the humanity of not using a top sheet. I don't think I've been more upset about anything since the Hindenburg. And um, speaking of flammable, um, I have to admit, even though I'm sort of a quasi sociologist, at least when it comes to media, I get really, I, I can never keep these generational separations straight. I'm never quite sure, you know, I know like I'm at the end of the baby boom, you know, but I can never quite keep all the rest of them in like exactly how that falls out. I, but I do sense a difference here. And I do see uh, even from Tracy's unscientific informal poll, the 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 younger people were who were responding it does seem like the less likely they were to use a top sheet now my big takeaway from that is who knows <laughs> i have no idea why that would be the case except that i don't know like they're they just haven't come to grips with how important delicious comfort in your life is yet um, and, you know, this whole thing about it, I, I've heard not just cats say it, but a lot of people that it gets like crumpled up at, at the end of the bed. My response to that is you just don't know how to make a bed <laughs> because if you make your bed properly, then it stays nicely in, in place unless you're, you know, thrashing around uh, like someone on ecstasy while you're sleeping and while there might be times that that would be appropriate that is what not i do when i sleep every night <laughs> oh, oh, okay all right so there's there's my hypothesis colin that all the millennials are just on ecstasy all the time so they just can't handle having that on them all right i you know i mean uh, that's uh, all the emails need to go to Bill Usman from you millennials. Uh, that's all, I, all I'm going to say about this. But um, but yeah, I, I, for, first of all, I should just declare that my, in my house, we do not use a top sheet, but I would like to have a top sheet, but we just don't happen to use a top sheet. And I would especially I'm sort of with you on this, Helder. I have a 75 pound dog who, you know, plops himself in the bed every night and he's probably just covered with bugs and stuff like that. I would just any more layers that could go in between me and him would be very, very welcome. I'm not even really quite sure why we don't use the top sheet, but I, I'm not even, you know, I don't even have a voting interest in matters like that. I don't think. And you're betraying your generation. Yes, I am betraying my generation, but I do that on a regular basis. You're an anomaly. Yeah. So I don't know if there's, a, you know, Kat, maybe you should have the last word here, and I don't know if there's anything you want to add to this based on all that you've heard. I mean, I guess, first of all, I don't even know. What generation do you consider yourself to be a part of, assuming you do? I mean, I guess I'm a millennial. I'm 33. So. Okay. So do you feel like this is a generational thing? Do you feel like other millennials feel in the way that the Wall Street Journal suggested that this is just some kind of unnecessary weird thing foisted on you by baby boomers and Xers who just make up stupid rules that have no meaning? Listen, I don't think it's like a weird thing that was like forced upon me. Obviously, you know, if you don't want one, don't use one. But um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I, I guess it would be a generational thing. I'm going to have to poll people and see if it's just uh, the, old, the older people using top sheets. I mean, if I wanted one, I'd have one. But, you know, as I said, I think they're trash. So. Right. You right. Ask them the about their them. ecstasy right. use also. Yeah, definitely. Hey, that was only that. once and I hated it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know. Maybe, Tracy Wu Fastenberg, you started all this. Maybe you should have the last word. Have we learned anything from all this? Is there a meaningful takeaway or are people just sort of who they are? I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's nice to have a healthy debate about something that utterly matters nothing to the next person, because mm -hmm. whether you have a top sheet or not has no effect on me either. 
and we will sit there and we can debate something as ridiculous as this. Although I still don't understand where it all got started. Right. Well, that's but, a per- that's the perfect segue into our second topic of the first segment, which is kind of about the way the word toxic is being used these days. Once again, this is sort of a generational thing and it has a lot to do with millennials and Gen Zers and what I would call sort of digitally native generations, generations who have essentially grown up never without the Internet. The Internet was sort of there from the time of their birth. Uh, and I think that's a very different experience in certain ways. And and I think it affects what we're about to talk about. Uh, this is a piece written by Caitlin Tiffany, which is like the most millennial name ever uh, in the <laughs> Atlantic. Uh, it's called That's It, You're Dead to Me. Suddenly everyone is toxic. Um, and, and she begins by talking about a situation in which she was ultimately described by someone else as toxic. And then that person cut her dead. Uh, that person no, never spoke uh, to her again. Uh, and this does seem to arise, this use of the term toxic. It's not a, not a new word. It's not a new word to apply it to people or relationships. That's been happening for forever. Um, but somehow or other, because of Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and Reddit, uh, there's a sort of a lot of talk about so how your friends could be toxic and what should you do. And maybe you should just eliminate them from your life. Um, and so... Helder, you almost didn't want to do this topic, partly because you feel like you find yourself in these conversations with people. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about what those conversations are are like. But in a kind of generic way, what did you mean by the fact that you're already exhausted by the topic of toxic people and toxic relationships? I'm going to preface it with the fact that there's probably people listening going, yes. my dude, you are the toxic one to me. Yeah. So... <laughs> Let's just start there and get that out of the way, um, because I'm filling in the Carolyn Payne character for today, right? That's my job. Part of Carolyn Payne was played by Hildra Maria. Right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways in different friend groups that we discuss different things that are toxic, but all kind of coming back to what that article is about and more like having friends that you find toxic or relationships you find toxic that you do have to break off to like keep yourself from... um, going insane or going down the spiral and i'm sure there's plenty like i said plenty of people probably did it to me and i'm unaware and we just kind of like went our separate ways and that's the nicest way to do it i guess um but then there's like what i see online a lot and and discuss on like reddit and twitter which is toxic fandoms which i thought you know we were just discussing earlier with uh how people reacted to castings to different both on sandman and other projects like there's a specific toxic fandom i can't stand and i go out of my way to not interact that much with it, but uh, inevitably it, it pops up on my trending feed or my Reddit feed or whatever uh, social media I'm on. And I either try to look the other way and just cringe and try not to like let it get to me. But then I try also the other thing is to not feed into it or feed it and fuel it by being the toxic aggregate a- agitator and being like, you know, no, those Zack Snyder films are not good and like go and push my little buttons on how to like, <laughs> you know, counter their argument of why, you know, Ezra Miller should continue to do the flash when he was, when they were completely miscast to begin with. So that's where like, I get like, oh, I'm just so exhausted of like the idea of it or what it's done. And, but know that it's a thing. It is like, it is something that is part of our lives and like how to like really kind of say, what is a, a toxic thing that you need to cut off like in this article where um tiffany's talking about her roommate r- her boyfriend's roommate calling her toxic just for saying she didn't want to have that discussion anymore i mean that's a, a complete extreme but like who hasn't been there who hasn't kind of just like thrown into thrown their hat into the loop of like you know breaking up a, a discussion to like say oh i can't take this anymore and someone else is just so put off that they walk away forever and are just going to say like no that person's trash for for saying that you know so I, i'm going to go over to often. yeah i'm going to go over to our media studies professor here uh, cuz uh, although you kind of failed me a little bit on the sheets thing uh, but i this so is your, what else is new this is your chance to make up for it so no i do feel like this digitally made of native class uh, of people these essentially two generations of people you know, to me, there's a distinction between 
a sort of a, an internet only set of interactions. There's people that I know mainly from social media. Uh, if they're mm-hmm. bothering me, if I'm not enjoying my contact with them, I unhesitatingly block them, uh, and I don't think twice about it. But I mean, I think there's sort of an, a should be a latent understanding. The people you actually know, people that you encounter in the flesh on a regular basis, can't really be dealt with that way. You can't just sort of declare them toxic. Well, you can, but I think to your detriment. I mean, one of the uh, paragraphs in the article that we read that jumped out at me, in 2016, the writer Sarah Shulman yeah. published a book called Conflict is Not Abuse. Um, she argues that the that overstatement of harm can cause more harm. The person seen as good will be supported and the person seen as bad will be shunned. On social media, she uh, said these binaries become even more entrenched because people are encouraged to take sides. I think that describes the problem. I mean, you know, we know what we old guys, we know what life is like. You you have to ride <laughs> out some of these undulations in life uh, and people will occasionally disappoint yeah. you and then please you, you know, six months later. Yeah, well, you keyed right in on the exact same paragraph I was going to talk about, Colin. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm done. <laughs> no, no, but but that's absolutely right. That that Sarah Schulman book, "Conflict Is Not Abuse." I'm familiar with that book, and I th- and I think it's actually uh, an, an important and very you know, even though it's six years old now, very timely book because it's it's about just as the quote says, and as you read, this binary thinking which can lead to um, real uh, hyperbole about exactly what it is that we're experiencing. And from a media studies perspective, I'll try not to fail you this time. um, I think that the, the difference here is that there is the larger culture and then there is our interpersonal relationships. And what's happened with social media in particular is social media is kind of a bridge between the larger culture and our interpersonal relationships. Social media is simultaneously what we used to call mass media and interpersonal communication. Uh, it's a it's a blurring. And so there is, um, people write about a context collapse. And I think there there's something of, of that nature that's happening here. And look, let's face it, there are some things in our world that really are toxic. I think there's a tremendous amount in our political culture right now that I think the word toxic absolutely is an apt description of. But then there's that dilution. There's that um, tendency to have it apply to more and more things. So if you do something to me that I find slightly annoying, all of a sudden you become a toxic person and that's not doing any of us any good. That's the same kind of binary, you know, there are good people and there are bad people uh, sort of sorting that we we're doing these days that I think lead us into some real interpersonal problems, but also into some larger cultural problems. Yeah, you know, and Tracy, I think Bill's getting at exactly what worries me about all this. And when we first started talking about it, you brought up cancel culture, which I do do think has some kinship with this idea. I think they're different, but the kinship is that sort of thing that if 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 I can identify something that you've done that's bad, then I'm done with you, as opposed to willing to kind of let the whole relationship play out or consider context, consider history. And that's what worries me about the way toxic is described in this article. But what were your thoughts? I mean, I would, I'd agree with Bill too. There is this kind of like dilution and blurring that's happening. And I wonder sometimes when you think about it in the context of social media, because we can cut something off with a click of the mouse or tap of the phone, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, or close out a conversation and walk away because we've become familiar and habitualized in that. We're then translating that to our everyday life. And, And like, you know, others have said, that's not something that's actually feasible in reality, but we do become a, a portion of us becomes used to being able to do that and feeling like, well, then that's the way to solve it here as well. And I, I think that a cancel culture and, you know, toxicity, they're not the same, but they're cousins, maybe second cousins in that, you know, it, it started out as something that does actually apply to certain things, canceling someone, if you want to call it canceling someone who's toxic in a celebrity. Um, but 
the more we use it, the less meaningful it becomes. There are toxic relationships. There are toxic situations. There are toxic people, but it doesn't apply to everyone and everything. Part of it is just life. Part of it is the fact that we are imperfect beings and we have to deal with it. That is reality. Right. I totally agree with what the thing that you said about if you use the word like toxic too much, you gradually empty out its meaning and it just becomes mm-hmm. kind of a hollow shell of, of what it was. We have to go to a break. I want to just say one last thing, though, which is I think another contributor to all this, either the, a contributor or a manifestation, uh, I'm not sure which, uh, are reality TV shows. The premise of reality TV shows is that you can get rid of yeah. people you don't like uh, because they're, they are elimination dances. Somebody goes away uh, every week, which is not how real life is supposed to work. You can can't just get rid of people because they bother you. All right, let's take a break and then we'll be back. All right, we are back. Sandman uh, is a Netflix series adaptation of a DC slash Vertigo comic book written by Neil Gaiman. The original comics ran from 1989 to 1996. The series was developed by Gaiman uh, and two other creators. Uh, And, well, I'll read the Netflix synopsis generously provided by Jonathan McPants. When the Sandman, a.k.a. Dream, the powerful cosmic being who controls all our dreams, is unexpectedly captured and held prisoner for over a century, he must journey across different worlds and timelines to fix the chaos his absence has caused. All right, so let's hear a little clip from this. You're going to hear the character who plays that monarch of dreams uh, and another character who is, well, uh, Dream's sister, uh, among other things. Here we go. Okay, so what's the matter? What do you mean? I can tell something's wrong. I mean, look at you. Sitting here, moping, pigeon feeding. It's not like you. You're right. Something is the matter. When they captured me, I just had one thought. Vengeance. It wasn't as satisfying as I'd expected. Meanwhile, my kingdom had fallen apart. My tools long since stolen and scattered. And so I embarked upon a journey to find them. Which I did. I'm now more powerful than I have been in eons. And yet, Here you are, feeding the pigeons. You see, until then, I'd had a true quest. A purpose beyond my function, and then suddenly it was over, and... I felt disappointed. Let down. Empty. Does that make sense? So you can hear it as that kind of snap, snapping, crackling dialogue you associate with, like, you know, His Girl Friday or something like that. Um, <laughs> the, the series does have a, a pretty interesting cast. Uh, David Thewlis, who's always wonderful to watch, has a major role, assuming there are major roles. Some holdovers. I have this whole theory that all the fantasy franchise stuff, the walls are just collapsing and they're all going to be, everybody's going to be together in one thing. So two holdovers from Game of Thrones, Charles Dance and Gwendolyn Christie, a.k.a. Brienne of Tarth, uh, are in this thing too. Patton Oswalt provides the voice of a raven. We may talk about that and whether it works. Tom Sturridge is the person playing Dream, who you just heard here. So, Bill, maybe you, you can kind of get us started here. This sort of, first of all, we should say Neil Gaiman as a creator occupies a very specific and very important place in the world of fantasy and, and the blending. Uh, he writes novels, he writes graphic novels, he writes comic books, and, and his stuff often does make it to the screen. But how did you feel about this one? I feel pretty good about it, but I would not have said that uh, if we were having this, if only four episodes had dropped 
and we were having this conversation when i first started watching it i i was pretty lukewarm about it um there were some interesting things including an absolutely charming uh gargoyle uh who my cat weirdly fell in love with and was crouching and staring at it um but overall it wasn't really grabbing me that much and there were uh, I, I, I wasn't into the characters who were not really being developed in any way. And, and I actually think that's a problem throughout that maybe other people will mention because we've talked about it. But then about half, in fact, exactly halfway through, there is what I think is an absolutely fantastic episode called 24 seven. And I won't give any spoilers, but it's uh, a really fascinating very very dark story that i think gets into questions about well maybe this is in some way related to the toxicity conversation um that civilization itself requires a certain amount of deception from all of us and there's you know how real can we be before things just break down into barbarism uh and then the next episode the sound of her wings is poignant and lovely and beautiful and so from from that moment on i was much more into the series and ended up feeling mostly positive about it although i would say it's it's certainly not my favorite thing that i've watched recently but but i think it's it's worthwhile ov overall it just takes a while to get there Right. That fifth, that fifth episode is fascinating in, in terms of the look of it, too, which is, I think, pretty different from the rest yeah. of the series. It really kind of looks like Martin Scorsese directed an Edward Hopper painting. You know, there's this that, that yeah. kind of the sort of the weird loneliness of, of the diner. So I'm saving can I, can I add a little something into that. Uh, yeah, I was going to save you for the end because you're kind of the okay. arch druid of nerddom. But go ahead. You're you're ready to go. Uh, well, specifically that particular because that is actually a, that issue within the context of the series starting is a turning point artistically as well because that's hmm. when mike drigenberg takes over as uh as the actual artist versus sam keith who created the original look which has very much like if it bleeds into the the first four episodes that we watch um and then mike drigenberg comes along and it becomes this very kind of grounded look just like that episode so i, I really love that they went so far as to create that uh feel of the actual comic within the TV show itself and and bring it down to grounded reality uh, with with stuff like that and the, that very beautiful cinematography that Bill was talking about. So Tracy Wu Fastenberg, you know, this is also one of these fantasy series which does not rely on, I don't know, sort of people who seem more or less human uh, doing human things and being bound by the limitations of humanity. I mean, these are a lot of these people are gods or some kind of spiritual divinities or, or something. And sometimes when they fight, there's a there's a fight that takes place that just consists of these two antagonists saying different things to each other, which kind of conjure up mental realities. But I mean, it's not like anybody draws a sword and cuts off anybody's head. It isn't like that. So it, it does feel like it requires a different kind of audience stretch to latch onto it. Maybe you can talk about how that worked for you. I noticed that also um, because it does do so much in the world of humans, but it doesn't focus on humans itself, except, you know, maybe that, that fifth episode that you're just talking about in the diner. Um, I think it worked. It worked for me. I, I, I didn't need that sort of piece of it for, for it to resonate, to keep me entertained. And it was actually that particular scene with the, the duel in the mines. I actually loved that. And I don't mind a fighting scene, uh, a physical fighting scene or, you know, duel or whatever with swords in my in my movie watching either. But this one was just it was more fascinating to watch. And just the concept of it was different than what you normally see. So I thought it was actually a little um, better than had they just, you know, brought out the, the knives and the swords and chains and whatnot. So. Um, I liked the way that they did it. I am not familiar with the source material. So I'll be honest that some of the things Halder has referred to in either emails here or here, it, it doesn't, it goes over my head a lot, but mm -hmm. as far as just watching it pure, purely as a neophyte, 
I enjoyed it and it, it did work for me. Yeah, you know, Helder, I'm sort of in a similar category to, to Tracy in the sense that, you know, I don't really know the particular source material all that well. And as I've conveyed, I conveyed about an hour ago to everybody, I, I, there isn't an episode of this that I've watched so far that I haven't enjoyed. I've enjoyed the episodes. The art direction's really great. A lot of these actors are really terrific. And individually, you know, there's some pretty good dialogue and a lot of interesting ideas on the screen. I just don't care about how it comes out. That isn't really interfered with my enjoyment that much. But I'm not at the end of it yet. I don't know if I'll get to the end of it. If I don't get to the end of it, it won't be because I don't like individual episodes, but because I don't really, I mean, the whole thing, I'm not spoiling anything. The whole thing begins with this godlike being, Dream, and he loses these three tools and he needs to get them back. And I don't know, I just, <laughs> I'm not worried enough about how this goes. I would, would react to that a little bit, Helder. Um, that's a lot. I'm also trying to like think of how it relates back to the actual series. I mean, reading it when I was growing up, it was a, uh, I felt the same way that you're actually describing Colin where like, I, I wasn't really taken in at first until like you get to like these issues where you start having a lot more human con human characters reacting, but there is something so human about the main uh, catalyst for it where uh, Charles dance's character wants to capture death to like bring back people from, um, from the dead and, and instead captures dream and everything goes to hell. So, you know, and, and that you get, but it, it does sort of slow down the first few episodes as they're establishing this um, uh, this realm and this idea of what the what the story is all about. Um, and yeah, I can see where it's tough to get into that part and get into that uh, to the story and to the characters, especially when Dream himself, as he's portrayed both in the book and and even on screen here through Tom Sturridge, is such a like prick. Like, such a, like <laughs> too late. <laughs> you know, he is that God. He's that God that's like unforgiving to a you know to a fault. He's, he's just as so uncaring while trying to say he cares. And then it's hard to like care for him as a character, um, even throughout the whole book series at points. But then there you get these little shining moments where he tries to become human. And for the it's interesting to hear like you and Tracy discuss like coming into this kind of cold with none of that history of what it meant to be a, a, an adolescent uh, or young adult in the 90s picking this up for the first time and seeing um, different worlds that weren't there in, on, on the comic page for certain people um, to see that kind of come to life both in the comic at the time and now and like it's why it's been such a like big phenomenon throughout its almost 40 year history 35 sorry for math and that was my major but like uh just seeing mm. it kind of like resonate with people still to this day is is fascinating to me i don't yeah. know if i answered your question no i think I, I actually i thought you answered it beautifully and and i think you know having that particular context you're gonna have a radically different relationship to this material but so bill you know, I guess maybe the last question that i would ask and i'll ask the media studies professor the other thing is we kind of have you know, I don't know. You and I grew up in an era where there were comic books and there were some there were science fiction novels and stuff, but fantasy wasn't a dominant genre. You had to go looking for it. And even probably in the 90s, Helder had to do a little bit more looking for or digging for uh, gems in in the entire haystack of fantasy. But it's almost the dominant mode these days. Fantasy, sci-fi, comic books that have kind of overwhelmed uh, pseudo-realistic um, things on the uh, on all kinds of screens. And I kind of wonder about that, too. Like, if I'd seen this, you know, in the era when the only thing that was anything like it on television was Twin Peaks, you know, the only thing that represented a substantial <laughs> re-envisioning of reality you know, on television was Twin Peaks, I bet you I would be just gaga over this thing. Maybe we're just getting a little jaded. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Like fantasy saturation in 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 some ways. And and there was stuff back then, but you know, a lot of it was kind of like corny science fiction like Lost in Space or something like that. And and this you know, this is although, you know, they often talk about fantasy and science fiction uh as one kind of large mega genre, they really are quite different in terms of their approaches where, you know, fantasy being much more about, you know, just magic com completely. And, um, 
you know, obviously in the media world, if something is a big success, then it keeps getting recreated. So Game of Thrones is now coming back in its new incarnation. And because that was such a huge hit, you know, it it's not unlikely that you get a lot of more stuff, you know, the, the, the dragons and dungeons for lack of a better term kind of fantasy. And um, it's not one of my favorite genres. I'm much more into the more uh, speculative fiction aspects of it. But I, but when people do become fans of it, they become real hardcore fans about it. And, you know, they get into the cosplay and, and, and all that other stuff. So it does definitely touch in something dare i say that people dream about because it's so wide open and 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 so much can happen and it's really uh unbound by any earthly realities right so we are, i think we have to stop there although i will say that uh, you know if you're engaging in cosplay you probably don't need a top sheet uh just to <laughs> sort of tie a little bow and all this stuff i also right. i just wanted to pick up one one thing that you said not Three weeks don't go by, Bill, where I don't think this would be so much easier to explain if everybody knew who Dr. Zachary Smith was. Um, <laughs> like Kev, like Kevin, Kevin McCarthy would be so easy to explain if I could if everybody if I didn't have to explain who Dr. Zachary yeah. Smith is. So anyway, and a lot of people are now hitting the Googles. Yeah, right, right? Exactly. All right. We've got to take a break here. We'll come back. This wonderful panel will make some recommendations. See, the thing about Dr. Zachary Smith is he would be going, Robot! Robot! Kill the January 6th invaders! Kill the U.S. Capitol invaders! Spare me! Spare me, robot! I am so afraid! And then about an hour later, he'd go, Oh, no, I wasn't afraid of those people at all. That's exactly <laughs> Kevin McCarthy. All right. Uh, it's time to say some, th <laughs> it's time to take some thank say some thank yous. We will start out with Kat Pastor. She is our technical producer. She's something else that I, I need to memorize. Uh, and uh, also Jonathan McPants, uh, who is the person who picked out all the music and booked all the guests and did everything basically and I'm just sort of Ted Knight I'm just reading the script uh, It's uh, and so thanks to both of them and it's time to make some recommendations Tracy Wu Fastenberg why don't you get us going here so as the panel knows I spent all day Wednesday in the Hartford Hospital emergency department um, getting fixed up from a lovely lovely stomach mm. bug um, and it was it was a long day they were thorough they were fabulous um, but in my time of hanging out in a curtained room for 12 hours, I overheard a lot of conversations about how busy they have been. And working in a hospital myself, I can only endorse patients with your healthcare providers because the other things that I heard from the curtained area were patients being not so understanding and, and a little demanding. And I can't even imagine what it has been like for our healthcare providers, um, especially emergency departments um, over the past couple of years and then to still be in surges and, and facing all of that. So just a little ki more kindness and gentleness to, to those important people and, and anyone else who's, you know, teachers going back and whatnot. And also I have to endorse a local ceramicist, uh, Studio T Ceramics. Um, you can find her on Instagram under that, Studio T Ceramics. She does really, really lovely work. I have a couple of her pieces. Um, so please go check it out. She is local to West Hertford and um, beautiful work. All right, beautiful endorsements. Uh, Bill Usman, how about you? Well, first, I love that Zachary Smith, Ted Knight, and in our emails, Columbo have all come up. <laughs> <laughs> and so go watch some old TV uh, if you don't know what we're talking about. Uh, my other endorsement is some current TV. A couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, Jonathan McNichol bullied me into getting Paramount Plus. So I decided, OK, I've got to get, you know, more out of this than just Star Trek. So Lori and I have been watching a show called The Good Fight which is a spinoff of the Juliana Margulies 
uh, lawyer drama, The Good Wife, which we were really into. Uh, kind of, you know, somewhat old fashioned comfort, kind of episodic TV with, with fun characters. The Good Fight is a lot of fun and it takes it into this absurdist, satiric kind of realm. So it's touching on current politics, but in a really uh, absurdist kind of way. And so it's got a great cast, it's enjoyable, and it comes back for its sixth season in a couple of weeks. All right. I also recommend 1883. I know there's like supposedly a whole bit of, bunch of politics attached to uh, all these Taylor, uh, Taylor Sheridan series, but 1883 is really terrific. Um, all right. Uh, and Helder Miro, what have you got for us? So uh, two quick things. One is uh, buried... I think, unfortunately, amongst all the like news comic book stuff coming out, there's a series called Paper Girls on um, on Amazon Prime that's based on a comic book series of the same name. Uh, that's really wonderful. It's uh, originally written by Brian Vaughn and il- beautifully illustrated by Cliff Chang. Uh, I recommend checking it out if you're, especially if you're into Stranger Things. This kind of like came al- around at the same time as Stranger Things started. I think a year. It predates it by a year. But it's a really wonderful uh, looking series. And then on top of that, I'm going to recommend hit up your local comic book shops, uh, wherever you are, wherever you're living. Like if you're into comics and fantasy or you're interested in it, go there. Don't do the Amazon or any anything else after I just recommend something on Prime, whatever. But uh, definitely <laughs> check out like your local comic book shop, support them. They can help you find comics and other reading material. And they're great for young readers too. So great way to start them reading. All right. I'm going to piggyback on to what uh, Hilder's talking about and recommend a podcast called Imaginary Worlds. It is hosted by a former NPR guy, Eric Molinsky. And it really is. I think the descriptor says something like uh, the, the, the podcast is basically if NPR happened at Comic-Con every single day or something. There's uh, a sense of that. But he brings a lot of the uh, NPR sensibility to it. Maybe slows himself down a little bit on some of the episodes. I should say I discovered it. Uh, through Decoder Ring, which is this kind of slate-based podcast hosted by Willa Paskin. I would also recommend their episode on Rod McEwen. It's an episode we absolutely could have and should have done on the Colin McEnroe show, but it is just terrific. Uh, And a reminder of this titanic figure of a certain period of popular culture who nobody remembers, or almost nobody remembers. Uh, but uh, but back to Imaginary Worlds, um, Malinsky's podcast, it, it is sort of about, you know, a lot of the stuff that Helder's been talking about. It's, it is about uh, all, all the science fiction and fantasy and comic book stuff. Uh, but he kind of goes at it thematically. I just listened to an episode uh, about mentors uh, and how they occur in comic books and other kinds of fantasy. And he talked to lots of pointy-headed intellectuals about that. And then I'm going to um, recommend a piece of fiction, a piece of short fiction from The New Yorker. Uh, it is by an uh, author I didn't really know, but I, I am now determined to get to know. I believe he's uh, Trinidadian in origin. Uh, his name is Andre Alexis. And he wrote a, a short story called, and I'm going to attempt to pronounce the word, Whinnam, I think is how you say it. Whinnam were, were the horse people in Gulliver's Travels. They were the sort of noble uh, race that didn't really know even what a lie was. But Whinnam, the short story, is about something else. It is about a young man grieving for his father and addressing that grief through a relationship with his father's horse. Um, and I don't want to say anything else about it because – the, the story has a real turn in it, a real sharp turn uh, at a certain point. But I was just enthralled by it. Um, and there are little whispers and wisps of Italo Calvino, who uh, Andre Alexis actually kind of salutes on a New Yorker podcast I was listening to today. So when him, just dig it out, either go find it on the website or dig it out of the pile of New Yorkers on your coffee table, whatever. All right. Thanks very much to this wonderful panel. Uh, thanks so much also to the wonderful staff of this show. And let's have our friend Grayson Hugh just take us out here. Yeah, we all be laughing, talking, joking, talking about this and talking about that. And talk about everything as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Talk about Torrington, Vernon, Danbury, Waterbury, Oliveberry, Woodbury, getting on New Britain, Vernon, I already said that one, Avon, Farmington, yeah, 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 yeah.